So as, as Emily said, I am Stephanie Frischi and I'm presenting just the one hour version of Cersei's Soil Life Project or, or curriculum. And we'll be talking about how all the life in soil, especially the invertebrates, relate to soil health um, and how many of those are beneficial insects. So we're getting beyond the, the bees and the butterflies and those pollinator topics, which are also really important and interesting. Um, we just have you know, an hour total here and only about 40 minutes of presentation. So we're really only gonna be able to skim the surface, but I wanted to let you know that we have this companion handbook um, which is available as a free PDF download and it goes into much greater detail on each of the topics and the organisms that I'll touch on in this webinar. And then coming up later in the summer, uh, we don't have dates scheduled yet, but we do offer this as a four hour online short course that also gets more into um, details and things. So you can um, sign up for Xerces um, social media or e-newsletters or watch our events page if you're interested in those. So our outline for today is we're going to have about um, I said 40 minutes of presentation and then 15 or 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. And these are the, the main themes or topics that we'll go through here during the presentation. Uh, just a bit of background about the Xerces Society. We're an international conservation nonprofit organization focused on invertebrates and their habitats. We were formed in 1971 by Dr. Robert Michael Pyle and originally were an organization of butterfly scientists. The name Xerces is um, in tribute to the butterfly pictured here, the now extinct Xerces blue butterfly. It was the first butterfly to be lost to extinction in the United States due to destruction of its habitat in the San Francisco area. And so Xerces was initially formed to prevent the extinction of other butterfly species. And since those 50 years have, have elapsed, uh, we have really grown and we now have over 60 staff um, across more than 20 states and working um, like I said, throughout the Americas and in some other countries as well. We have several program areas. We have a pesticide team, which is actually kind of like the anti-pesticide team. They work on reducing the use and harmful impacts of pesticides. The pollinator team, of which I'm part of, focused on the habitat and agricultural biodiversity part of invertebrate conservation both working with the, the private sector and large food companies, as well as in government programs. There's an endangered species team, which focuses especially on species like Western monarch butterflies, bumblebees, fireflies, and freshwater mussels. And then we have a wonderful team of folks that work on communications, publications, and engagement. Invertebrates and conservation of them is really a priority. If we look at all the described species on earth, fungi, plants, invertebrates, and vertebrates, about 70% of all described species are invertebrates. Um, it's just those other animal groups here you can see in the, the pie chart, how that um, breaks out. So among animals, 95% of species are invertebrates. So with so much diversity, the fate of the world and insects is really inseparable from our own. Insects are part of the ecology of soil health. They're involved in pest control, ecological function of systems and crop pollination. Um, they're part of nutrient cycling and decomposition. They help manage pest populations because they have to eat also. And they turn plants into food for other animals. So many of birds, especially when they're raising their chicks, they are gathering insects like the caterpillar pictured here. And that's what they're feeding as a high protein, highly nutritious food to their developing chicks. Um, and also by pollinating the plants that other animals eat as grains or fruits, whether it's humans or wild animals, those insect pollinators are turning plants. Um, into food as well. And then, of course, from the plant's perspective, 
invertebrates and the pollination services they provide are important for plant reproduction. Despite the, the real importance of insects, you know, we're in a, a period where so much decline and disappearance of insects is being documented. Uh, I've got a firefly pictured here or a lightning bug. That's a little bit of a teaser that this is one of the soil invertebrates that I'll be talking about later. Um, but just a takeaway here from a study that measured insect biomass declined by 76% in German nature reserves in the period between 1986 and 2016. And this was, you know, in a nature, nature reserves where you'd expect invertebrates would be doing better than in other highly altered areas. So it's, you know, really concerning trends, um, whether it's bees, honeybees, wild bees, butterflies, all these patterns are, are paralleling each other. What's the status of soil invertebrates? Um, soil invertebrates, and also these are many of the soil dwelling larval stages of insects, a real major biodiversity pool in terrestrial ecosystems. These are actually really neglected and understudied in many biodiversity databases and assessments. And therefore, they're also not considered so much um, in conservation actions policies. So this, this review here, Eisenhower et al. 2019, is really making the call to action that given that a major fraction of invertebrates live below the ground and considering their significant functional role, um, biodiversity monitoring urgently needs to include these organisms and their associated functions. Four major causes of insect decline have been defined, and those are habitat loss, pesticides, disease and non-native species, and climate change. So that's the bad news. The good news or the, the opportunity for action and improvement is listed below each arrow point there. So we can conserve and create habitat, can reduce our reliance on pesticides. We can also reduce the risks from managed pollinator species and invasive plants. And then we can plan and support habitat that has high diversity of species, both plants, animals, and other organisms, so that they're more resilient to extreme weather events, changing timing of seasonal events, and you know, even kind of more extreme. Uh, periods of rain, drought, temperature, and fire. Okay, a bit now about soil and soil's magnificence. Um, you know, the more I learn and think about soil, it really is a pretty cool sphere of, of life on our planet. But just from a perspective of human utility, we talk about several main functions of soil. So it's a medium for plant growth and habitat for wildlife. Soil is where water supply is regulated and filtered. It's also where the recycling and storage of organic matter happens. And then it's important you know, in our construction, whether that's infrastructure like roadways or you know, wherever we are on land, there's some kind of soil beneath us. Moving on then into the basics of soil health, uh, one definition of what soil health means is the continued capacity of a soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that can sustain plants, animals, and humans. And the, the diagram here is one that's really helpful to look at the four management principles for supporting soil health. So the right hand two quadrants are about protecting the soil. So this is to minimize disturbance. An example is um, reducing or eliminating tillage. Uh, another way to protect the soil is by maximizing soil cover. Again, that's by leaving uh, crop residues or other organic litter and material there, as well as things like cover crops. And then 
The left two quadrants are about feeding the life in the soil. And those principles are to maximize continuous living roots. So soil wants to have something growing in it and plants want to be growing in soil. Often our farming practices, especially those that are with annual crops and cycles have these fallow periods uh, when the soil is bare or there's you know, no real vegetation there. So again, either relay cropping or using cover crops to keep some kind of continuous living root. Um, that's part of feeding the life in soil. And then the fourth principle is maximizing biodiversity. This is above ground in terms of the types of plant species that are, that are there. It includes the animals above ground, whether that's livestock or wildlife. Um, and then this in turn helps to increase the biodiversity below ground. You can get a glimpse of that here and we'll start to talk about how full soil is of all kinds of, of life. Um, an estimate is that one teaspoon of soil contains more living organisms than there are people in the world. This includes the real tiny things like bacteria, protozoans, nematodes, um, fungal filaments, and other really small um, animals. A big part of soil health are fungal and bacterial communities. And I think that's covered really well in other places since today. And, and the Thirsty Society focuses on invertebrates. I'm just gonna to touch on this here. Um, but again, bacteria are the most abundant soil organism in terms of biomass. They feed primarily on carbon. They contribute to decomposition. And in turn, they are eaten by micro and mesofauna. And one of the most relevant roles of bacteria is that they transform atmospheric nitrogen into other forms of nitrogen that then are available for plant uptake and growth. Fungi are also very abundant in the soil. They decompose plant residue as their primary function, and they also help to regulate pathogens. And a critical role for wild plant communities, as well as in agriculture, is how fungi help to multiply the capacity of roots to absorb water, nutrients, and to tolerate droughts. Fungi. And bacteria here, um, this is a, a generalized food web just to, to show the flow of energy. So green areas show the direction and relationship of energy flow between the groups. This, this figure does not show um, living plants and their roots or larger animals, but it does zero in on organic residues in the green triangle at the bottom. If we look at the bacteria here in these orange circles, you can see there's movement or transfer of energy um, through decomposition, but these are relatively short networks that end and don't connect directly to all the other groups. But when we look at how fungi interact in these systems and blue rectangles, you can see how they connect organic residues up with the, the mesoinvertebrates and the macroinvertebrates. So both fungi and bacteria are important, but have you know, different relationships in these ecological food webs. So there's all this life, and here's just a few bullet points of what all these animals um, are doing. Cycling nutrients, building soil structure, improving water infiltration and storage, enhancing plant productivity, helping to regulate climate through major earth systems like the carbon cycle, the water cycle, and uh, nitrogen cycle. They're balancing the populations of other organisms. Soil animals are also pollinators and they're also food sources for larger species of wildlife. I showed the breakdown of some of the diversity of invertebrates among all uh, known species. And, and if we just focus on soil animals, that they're about 25% of the total diversity of all known living organisms. And as a generalized introduction here, this illustration is not to scale, but it just helps us um, you know, visualize kind of size and relative abundance from the smallest organisms, those bacteria, 
uh, and fungi as the most abundant. And then as, as soil animals increase in size, fewer are found per square meter. And this just helps to demonstrate how soil life needs creatures big and small and existing in an intricate web and depending on, on one another. Some of the ecological roles in large categories are um, decomposers. So they're at the interface of leaf litter above the ground and at the surface of the soil. Deeper into the topsoil, they help to enrich it by integrating nutrients. And then they're also soil engineers. They tunnel deeper into soil. They bring subsoil to the surface. And this in turn helps to hydrate and aerate soil. I want to mention that these illustrations I've, I've been showing are from a, a wonderful book called Life in Soil by Dr. Jim Nardi. He graciously has granted us permission to use the illustrations here. And I'm going to mention that book again when I get to the resources section. He, he gives another nice diagram to show how um, some of these food webs and different organism groups relate to each other as well. Okay, let's start talking about some individual groups here of soil invertebrates. So again, invertebrates are animals without backbones. Insects are about 80% of this group. 12% are arachnids, which are like the mites pictured here, as well as spiders. And um, starting from smaller to larger, we'll talk about rotifers. So these are really um, you know, small. You need some kind of magnification to see them. They live in water films within the soil, as well as in the, the leaf litter. Um, when the water film dries up, they can form cysts, which is a, a stage where they can rest in suspended animation that allows them to survive dry conditions. Tardigrades also are, are small and need some kind of magnification to view them. They live in water films as well. Um, they're sometimes referred to as water bears because they have these stubby legs and actually little claws on, on those legs. And like the rotifers, they can enter a, enter a state of suspended animation when water dries up to, to survive kind of those difficult um, conditions. So these are some of the, the first animals that are helping to, to break down or scavenge small bits of organic matter. Nematodes are uh, unsegmented transparent worms. And there are a lot of different species of nematodes. They're specialized, especially by the different mouth parts that they have, depending on their food sources. So um, in the lower right, you can see the leftmost mouth there on that nematode is a bacterial feeder that has lips to kind of grasp its food. The one in the middle has a piercing mouth part where it can puncture and suck the sap. Um, out of roots or fungi. These are the types of nematodes that can be economically damaging and considered as pests for plants on farms. And then the nematode on the right is a predatory one. So, you know, with a more clasping and grinding kind of mouth. Um, there's again, a lot of diversity within nematodes. So there's um, ones with short life cycles, others with longer. Uh, they can also enter suspended animation to survive difficult conditions, and they can also um, be indica indicators of, of quality, you know, in terms of how their presence correlates with nitrogen cycling and, and plant growth. However, they can be, you know, difficult to identify because you still need magnification to see them. Earthworms, um, these all have tube-like segmented bodies. They burn within the soil and they also consume leaf litter and the soil itself. That helps to improve soil porosity and water infiltration and nutrient transformation. And they also move an incredible amount of soil. However, about a third of worms in the US are introduced species. 
and it's only the Pacific Coast and some eastern states in the United States that have native earthworm species. The, the Pleistocene glaciation period actually uh, extincted many of the native earthworm species. And so for areas like Ontario or where I am, um, just south of Lake Michigan, these areas were glaciated and all the native earthworms were wiped out. And so any earthworm species in those areas are non-native ones which have been introduced and they can actually be detrimental uh, to some forest ecosystems especially. Then we can move into arthropods. So these are invertebrates with exoskeletons, segmented bodies and jointed appendages. Still a lot of diversity here. And something important to remember or review are these two types of life cycles, incomplete metamorphosis, where the eggs hatch into nymphs, which are basically smaller versions of the adult form, and then species that um, grow through complete metamorphosis, where you have the egg, then a larval stage, then the pupal stage, and then the adult stage. Springtails, or these are called columbula. These are actually pretty charismatic. You can see these with your naked eye and they get their name from the way they propel themselves around. They have the structure called a percula, um, which kind of helps catapult them as a way to either move or escape predation. And they contribute to decomposition by fragmenting plants and fungi. And they can also influence soil microbial communities through uh, their predation. Um, wood lice are also called sow bugs or kill bugs. Um, they actually can only live in moist environments because they lose water through their cuticle. They are primarily um, decomposers. So they're breaking down fresh debris uh, or older detritus. Millipedes, um, these are again getting into a bit larger ones. So these are distinguished in kind of these long worm-like, but they're segmented and they have an exoskeleton and they have two pairs of legs per segment. And these are essentially herbivores, decomposers, and scavengers. In contrast, the centipedes are primarily predators. They'll move a lot faster than a millipede and they have only one pair of legs per segment. And again, because they are predators, some of this can, some of them have, can inject venom. And if they're large enough, you know, they can uh, cause bite, painful bites in humans. Spiders are another really important group of predators um, with eight legs, two body regions, and multiple eyes. They are predatory both as nymphs and as adults. Some of them um, hunt, and those are the ones that can be more visible because they're kind of out, you know, searching for their prey. And then, of course, other groups spin webs directly on the soil or into tubes. Um, so these again are really important generalist um, predators. Okay, I've got um, a question here that you can respond to in the chat if you would like to. Just share if you've ever thought or wondered about soil invertebrates before today and kind of if yes, how or how What's your thinking or relationship so far with soil invertebrates? So I'll just let you guys fill that in. I'm going to um, continue here. I'm going to get into the insects next. So again, exoskeleton, um, three body regions, the head, thorax, and abdomen with three pairs of legs on the thorax and one pair of antenna. And many of these have wings. And here's just a, a smattering of diversity of insects here. You can test yourself and see how many of these you can name in your head. <clears throat> flies. So flies are actually quite beautiful and really diverse when you start to take a, a closer look at them. And a great number of them are important decomposers of plant material in their larval stages here. There are also um, some which are predators. So flower flies are also called hoverflies or surfed flies. 
So the adult there, they are pollinators that visit flowers to feed on nectar. But the larval stage, as shown here, those are actually predators. This is one feeding on an aphid. So um, there's a lot of different roles that, that flies and flower flies play. I'll talk about a few beetles here. Um, soldier beetles, again, this is an insect group that undergoes complete metamorphosis. So we've got an adult, um, actually two adults mating, and that's essentially what the adult stage is for, reproduction. Some adults may or may not feed, um, and some are feeding on other small insects and animals. Others feed on nectar <clears throat> and pollen. Uh, and then the lower picture is a larva of soldier beetles predating other insect eggs. So again, because of these two different life stages with different diets, this one group of beetles are filling different types of ecological roles. Fireflies, like I mentioned before, you know, we're most, especially if you're in the Eastern United States or Canada, um, Eastern North America and Central North America, you see these when they're flying, the, the adult stage. But the larval stage is highly predatory. And um, one, one species larva is pictured there in the lower left. And they live on the soil surface as well as in leaf litter and under bark um, in moist areas. And they are excellent predators of snails, slugs, earthworms, um, and other caterpillars. Tiger beetles, these are um, also predators. So, and they're quite fast and they're metallic and brightly colored. And depending on this, these can be fairly common. So this might be a soil insect that you are familiar with seeing the adult form. However, again, it's really the larval form. That's the predator here. Um, you can see a diagram, how they build a vertical tunnel and kind of lay in wait for unsuspecting prey to pass by. And then they can uh, pop out and grasp it and eat it. Um, and the other picture shows what that burrow looks like from, from above. Ground beetles. So the, the adults are a brown and they have ridged wing covers. The larvae, however, have these sickle life like jaws. Um, so depending on the species, these are predators, um, especially in the larval stage, but they also can play roles in decomposition and in eating weed seeds. And again, they're kind of generalists, they eat all kinds of, of prey species. Um, here's another example of a, a ground, ground beetle and good habitat for beetles is pictured in this um, beetle bank, this kind of planting where you've chosen different bunch grasses, multiple species, and here it's placed in a farm setting. Um, those are good places for beetles to live and then move out into the crop field to hunt prey and help manage pest populations. And dung beetles are also amazingly beautiful with kind of their larger bodies and metallic colors. These are important decomposers of manure and wildlife dung. They help reduce parasitic flies and food pathogen spread and they're really important um, in grazing operations. And it's been estimated that the value of, of decomposition they provide is worth around 380 US, $380 million US um, per year in terms of returning nutrients to the soil and preventing pathogens. And the adults will, will gather dung and actually lay eggs in it. And then it's the larval stage that consumes the dung. Ants, um, yeah, I think if you, if you think of an insect associated with soil, ants might be one of the first groups that come to mind. They of course are all over our planet, um, except for Antarctica, and they are ecosystem engineers, predators, decomposers, and seed dispersers. So eating all kinds of food sources depending on the species. 
Steph, I'm just going to let you know you're at your 35 minute mark. Okay, thank you very much. We're wrapping up. Um, uh, we're wrapping up here on insects. Bees. So, you know, bees, when they're out gathering pollen or honey, whether we're talking about the domesticated non native European honeybee or all the wild bees, of which there are nearly 4,000 wild bee species in North America. Um, you know, the, the mothers and the workers are out looking for pollen and nectar to bring back to the nest and feed the developing larvae. And over 70% of these native bee species nest in the soil um, in a kind of like tube or chamber system as pictured here. So at the surface level, it can look more like an ant nest if you notice that there's a little hole there at all. But the, the mother will excavate this tunnel and then lay a single egg, put a cache of, um, that's like a packet of pollen and nectar pictured there. And then when the egg hatches, the larva feeds on that, then pupates and then emerges as an adult itself. Um, you know, here's just a few pictures of uh, what a bee nest for a, a ground nesting bee can look like in the so, you know, keeping the soil covered is important, but some places with undisturbed but bare soil is also critical for nesting habitat for these pollinators. There are also ground nesting predatory wasps. So kind of similar idea to the bees, except they're feeding their larvae with um, the other insects or animals that they have hunted. So these are our predators. The adults are, are not gathering nectar and pollen to take back to feed the young. They eat that themselves, but what they're feeding the young um, are other arthropods. And then um, there are, you know, again, from a human or agricultural perspective, some soil invertebrates that are pests, like beetle grubs, wireworms, other, uh, the, the soil dwelling caterpillars of many moth species as well. And then in some conditions, uh, snails and slugs are also part of the pest contingents. But again, a healthy population of many beetle species, including lightning bugs, can help manage slug populations. All right, um, this is the, just another summary of, of a lot of those functions that I covered already. So in the sake of time, I'm gonna, um, quickly go through some practices and how they relate to soil life. So again, from the perspective of farming, or if you're a gardener, you can kind of scale it down to gardening practices and look at tillage, fertilizers, pesticides, and that above ground diversity, like what plants are growing there. Again, there are, it's a, it's a spectrum and we've got one end of that, where we can support more soil life through less tillage or no-till, um, using organic fertilizer and nutrients, lowering or reducing or eliminating pesticide use, and increasing the above ground diversity. Tillage is just going to cause desiccation and for the environment these animals live in to dry out. Uh, it breaks fungal hyphae, it destroys the tunnels, burrows, and nest sites. Synthetic fertilizers deliver a spike of a single or a few key nutrients, and you get correlating spikes in populations of microorganisms. And then a lot of that is also excess and is lost either to water or the atmosphere. And then pesticides, which includes insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, miticides. Um, the, these, of course, lead to the direct and indirect negative effects on these soil ecological communities. We are going to quickly talk here about some sampling methods or ways to just scout and observe. You know, a simple one is to put out a rock, a brick, a board, you know, anything for a few days or weeks and then lift it up and see what's underneath it. You can also um, do a homemade pitfall trap. A lot of the equipment that you need is available at the household level. A magnifier, 
like the hand lenses pictured here is a good tool. And also now there are lots of um, options for pretty economically accessible USB microscopes for under $100. And you can just plug it into a computer monitor and it projects the image on the screen. So that's a nice way to magnify some of these animals as well. Uh, a pitfall trap is essentially what it sounds like. You dig a little hole, you find a container like a disposable plastic cup that fits that hole and you know, smooth the soil flush against it. You may cover it to keep rain out of it. You just put it out typically overnight and, and it will catch whatever happens to walk by and fall in. You can leave it dry, um, come back and check it the next morning to see what's in there. Or if you're gonna leave it a little bit longer, um, put soapy water in there and that will kill and immobilize anything that falls in. Or if you're looking for dung beetles, you kind of put a little bait pot in the middle suspended above it of dung to, to attract um, those animals. It just gives you a snapshot of, of um, that place but you can use it to compare the same place in different seasons or across different vegetation types or the same kind of vegetation, but under different management systems. Xerces has this nice, just one and back soil scouting guide that will walk you through how to do a pitfall trap. Um, you know, and here's an example that was um, back in September few years ago here where I live uh, in Indiana in the central U.S. So one was in a cornfield along a perennial grass strip and then in a more diverse native pasture. Um, you know, and I, I got a few different kinds of soil invertebrates in that. The back side of this scouting sheet has a pretty easy data form to fill out. And so for that example that I just showed, the form is focusing on predatory soil insects or invertebrates like ground beetles, like the ground dwelling spiders or like tiger beetles. I did not have any in, in that example sample, but I wrote down rough quantities and the species that I saw. And so if I go back to this food web, you know, I saw springtails in the sample from the cornfield. And again, those are primarily decomposers, some are predatory. They live on the soil surface within soil layers. Um, so it's kind of you know telling me where th that makes sense for, for where those were observed. If I had also you know gotten some of those predators, that higher level in the food web, that you can think of that almost as equivalent to having an apex predator in an above ground terrestrial system. If you have wolves, for example, that means you have healthy populations of the prey and food sources for wolves. And it means that those prey animals have healthy food sources and environment for them and on down deeper into the food web. And so the same is true. You're finding um, these predator species in any of your soil sampling or scouting that's an indication that all the groups that are below them in the food web um, are also healthy and doing well. Okay, I'm gonna skip ahead here to just, I mean, these are beautiful, but a couple, for the sake of time, I'll skip through just some of the ways farms are applying these principles, um, you know, terminating a cover crop, but leaving that residue in place, interseeding cover crops, between the crop rows and putting in perennial native plant field borders on farms. Um, Clark Landing Cattle is a family operation near me that is just doing all kinds of innovative and regenerative practices. They're certified organic and no-till and they've got a lot of crop diversity as well as, as cover cropping systems and are really been able to move away from any kind of synthetic um, inputs. And even here, um, this photo is from the flower beds around my house. I've put some of these practices into place. 
the people who lived here before me had put down this impermeable weed fabric and I wanted to remove that. And, you know, underneath is something really hard and just minerals. You could hardly call it soil. So I've been working, um, I planted little cover crop mixes in here. I put in native strawberry plants as like an understory ground cover that I can also gather some food and sweetness from. And I also just use wheat straw as a mulch to help provide places for those animals like earthworms and the, the wood lice or sow bugs. Um, another question for the, the chat is if you want to share any particular practices that you've implemented or seen implemented um, to support soil life, maybe ones I just covered or additional ones, add that in the chat. And then um, I believe Emily has put in a link as well, which has more links. I believe Emily has put into the chat a link that will take you to a document that references all of these resources that I'm going to talk about. So the first two here are the Global Soil Biodiversity Atlas and um, a United Nations report on the state of knowledge of soil biodiversity. These are many hundreds of pages and highly technical, but they're also free and available as downloads. And then the third is the, the book um, from, from Jim Nardi, Life in the Soil, A Guide for Naturalists and Gardeners, which I also think is a great resource and reference on this topic. As I mentioned before, we have uh, this handbook that's available as a PDF and the upcoming online courses, as well as other publications from Xerces related to these topics, the soil scouting guide, as well as the foliage and flower scouting guides that, that I did a quick demo on. So Xerces has this huge publications library. We also have a YouTube channel where our longer soil life short courses have been recorded and are posted as well as many, many other webinars and trainings on topics. And then um, we've also produced several books, Attracting Native Pollinators and Farming with Native Beneficial Insects are more geared toward farmers and agricultural production, whereas 100 Plants to Feed the Bees, 100 Plants to Feed the Monarch, and Gardening for Butterflies are, are more for parks, um, gardens, and um, flower beds. And then, yeah, these two are also linked in that document that Emily has shared. So there's last year there was this great symposium on soil biodiversity, and that webpage has a lot of wonderful information and resources. And in the US, we have the Natural Resources Conservation Service within our Federal Department of Agriculture. And they have several sites, both for soil education and for soil health. So thank you to Emily, Kelsey, and Jessica of the um, St. Clair Region Conservation Authority, to the funders who've supported this work at Xerces, Northeast SARE, Western SARE, the Blooming Prairie Foundation, and Organic Valley. Thanks again to Dr. James Nardi for sharing his illustrations. And then my coworkers at Xerces, Jennifer, Eric, Emily, Sarah, and Mace, all of our Xerces Society members and other sponsors. And um, I'll just do one little mention here that donors make all of our work possible. We're a donor supported nonprofit. So if you're interested, um, you can visit our website and see about becoming a member. And my last slide here is, is just this quote from the 1914 US yearbook from the Department of Agriculture. The soils of our yards, gardens, and fields swarm with thousands of kinds of minute animals and plants of which we know very little or nothing. We depend on the soil for our very existence and yet the soil that we daily tread underfoot is almost a veritable terra incognita. Thank you, everyone. Um, I will be ready to do a few questions and answers here. If you can moderate that, Emily. 
Certainly. Um, so I just wanted to let everyone know that I will uh, post all of the resources again after the uh, question and answer period because everyone's very chatty in the chat, which is great. I love it, um, but I don't want it to get lost. So I will post it again. And then I'll also try and send out an email to all of the research, uh, sorry, everyone who registered um, to make sure you get those. Uh, so there was a couple questions while you chatted. Um, would you comment on how jumping worms affect soil critters? If jumping worms destroy the duff layer, will soil critters help to rebuild it? Yeah, so um, jumping worms are one of the new emerging invasive species. And um, I mentioned that there are some non-native earthworms. Jumping worms are a newer arrival to North America and they're moving and spreading faster than the existing non-native worms, but their, their detrimental effect to ecosystems is the same. They're kind of like over decomposing systems. You know, certain plants need um, a degree of duff. It helps buffer them from a lot of cold in the spring or from, from too much heat. Like right now, this season that we're in, again, in Eastern North America, all this, the forests have not quite leafed out and spring ephemerals are doing their thing and they need that, that leaf litter. Um, so where invasive worms are, whether they're including the, the jumping worms, there's just over decomposition of that soil duff, duff layer there. And unfortunately there's um, you know, not yet any real helpful management or, or um, control techniques for these worms. I mean, just trying to prevent the, the spread is the, the best action we can try to take for now. Awesome. Another question was, how do all these creatures survive winter when soil is frozen to uh, 12 inches or more in Michigan? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, so a lot of them um, are just, you know, they're, they're not warm blooded like we are, right? They're cold blooded. So they are just kind of going into this um, state of overwintering where their metabolism is slowed. Some of the real small animals go into um, that suspended animation, which is slightly different physiologically. And they can do that whether it's extremely cold or extremely dry. Um, I know it's, it's pretty like amazing to think of, but they're adapted to those conditions. So some, some may go deeper. Um, than the frozen level of soil, but others are, you know, able to be in those cooler temperatures. It's amazing what our native animals can do. Yep. <laughs> uh, one other one was how does their survival help with recover of native plant communities post fire? Uh, I'm not sure when this came up in your chat, but. Mm -hmm. Could you read that one more time, please? Mm -hmm. How does their survival help with recovering native plant communities post fire? Yeah, I'm not sure if I have enough details from that question to, to address it. Okay, if that person's still here, Sorry. they could provide more yeah, yeah. context in the, in the chat. Okay. We have another one though. Uh, when restoring areas from invasive monoculture back to native plant communities, what are key steps to take to improve the soil? Uh, example for bacterial and fungal communities. Yeah, this is a good question. Um, this I think depends a lot on that site history. Like what was it a monoculture of and for how long? Uh, what is the existing soil community, both in terms of microorganisms and in terms of these animals that we've talked about? Um, the plant roots of many, many native species have symbiotic relationships with different fungal groups. And when those are missing, that can be um, a challenge or a barrier to getting some of the, the plant species established. But overall, I think it's important to just contrast restoring or supporting native vegetation with agriculture, with farming and gardening. Um, those are two pretty different systems actually. 
with farming and gardening, we're kind of expecting that whatever we plant is going to grow, it's going to grow quickly, it's going to, you know, flower and mature quickly. And native plant communities, they have annuals, they have perennials, they have herbaceous plants, they have trees and shrubs, they've got all these different forms, but they're really designed for survival and longevity. So they're not um, the type like our agricultural or gardening species that are going to be quick and fast. So that's like on, on the plant level, um, but also just as a system, there'll be successional stages. And I think it's important to remember that we'll have a few years of, of clear transition from the monoculture and that post disturbance where there will likely be a lot of annual weeds and perhaps some perennial weeds. So um, being aware of those and, and doing appropriate management to prevent them from, from too much competition is important as you're also giving time to the, the native plants to develop their underground root systems and just kind of grow to full size over, over several years. Um, and then the other, so I think just like timing expectations is, is one part of that. And the other contrast is about soil fertility because we're expecting so much production so quickly from our uh, agricultural systems, we, we put so much emphasis on soil fertility. But in natural systems, it's much more, uh, I'll just say low key and balanced. And actually lower fertility is often, again, what native plants are adapted to compared to the higher fertility of agricultural soils. So again, I would not, um, you know, add fertilizers to soils where you're trying to, to establish native plants. You may actually just have to get through a few years while those excess nutrients are, are being lost or removed from that site. Yeah, uh, similar to when you're kind of restoring tall grass prairie in South mm -hmm. Ontario as well. It takes, mm -hmm. a, takes a year of kind of not very pretty fields and then it gets there. Yes, yeah, kind of have a just different expect, a different and appropriate expectation. Mm -hmm. We have one more question. Uh, how do we get our neighbors who believe in raking every single leaf and pumping their lawns full of pesticides to jump on board? I find the biggest issue as they refuse to consider anything other than a perfect lawn as desirable. I feel like this, speak this person is speaking about my dad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, gosh, you know. Um, Let's see, where can I start here? I love this question too. You know, I don't know if you've had a conversation with them yet, but it's kind of, and I assume you're doing your yard differently from how they're doing theirs. So to the degree that your neighborly relationship allows this, you know, I would talk about why you choose to manage your yard in the way that you do. Um, certainly reducing the amount of emissions from things like lawnmowers and leaf blowers is something that makes a neighborhood environment better as well as you know for the atmosphere um, and for noise pollution reduction. Pesticides are not good for um, plants, animals, microorganisms, or people in many cases. So just thinking about the well-being of, of pets or people who are using the lawn is another angle. Um, the economic one also, you know, a more wild or native or perennial yard can sometimes cost more to initially purchase and install the plants. But over the long term, just with reduced mowing um, and the time and cost of that, as well as the reduced inputs of, of um, herbicides or other pesticides, it just makes for lower costs in maintaining your lawn. And then, you know, I think we all have a responsibility to support the life around us. And a yard is our own little nature preserve as much as you wanna make it that. And it gives us also a beautiful place to be and see flowers and see butterflies and, and birds and have a nice environment as well. Um, I, again, I'll just, mention another resource is Healthy Yards. And that's a group out of New York State. I think if you just, you know, did a web search for them, their website has has a lot of great resources for kind of that that lawn sized um, 
Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, someone in the chat also said they emphasized the closer uh, proximity and health concern to small children and pets and um, tracking chemical applications in the house. So yep. I guess just having a, a good conversation and sometimes realizing people's oasis in their backyard is different, but yeah. Yep. Yeah. Or finding the right compromise for your neighborhood. You know, it looks a little more tame and managed in the front, but you can have it, you know, more wild in the back. Yes. Um, do you have time for a couple more, Stephanie? Is that okay? Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Dawn asked, how can I evaluate soil health life? Does it make sense to try to do this for an entire town? Entire town. Oh, sorry. interesting question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So trying to quantify or measure soil health is, is still something that soil scientists and specialists are working on. Um, you know, the typical soil tests, they might measure for a certain nutrient, a certain bulk density, percent organic matter, pH, more of these physical and chemical characteristics. And when you're talking about soil health, um, you know, some of those measurements might correlate to soil health, but there's still many pieces that are missing. So that's the biological elements and then the ecological, right? The relationship and interactions of those uh, physical, of those living and non-living components. So there are a few labs um, that you can send soil samples to. The um, Cornell University in New York State has one of the kind of the leading programs in trying to develop different tests and scoring for soil health um, and is continually, you know, working to refine that. And then the reason why I showed these, some of these scouting and sampling methods are that actually the best way to measure soil health is in place without digging up soil and sending it to a lab. Cause you wanna measure soil when it's intact. It's a system, it's a sphere. Um, and as soon as you dig that out and remove that, you know, you've, you've started to change it. So there are different kinds of infiltration tests that you can use. That are, that are pretty accessible and easy. You can do the pitfall trapping and see what organisms you get and what they indicate um, about it. So yeah, I guess my answer is there's, there's like no immediate solution, but I hope that those are a few options to consider. Thanks. And the last one um, actually kind of uh, refers back to when we were talking about neighborhoods. Uh, along that line, some neighborhoods that uh, have covenants that require sod yards. Would you address that through neighborhood associations? Yes. So you might have a neighborhood association or in the US they are HOAs, homeowner associations. Your own municipality or city or town could have its own weed ordinance or vegetation uh, regulations. So um, there, when you're, when you're dealing with a regulation or ordinance like that, if it's um, the HOA or the neighborhood group, again, I think same thing, like make your case of why having turf grass or sod is not necessarily the most desirable thing. Finding some kind of compromise, you might be able to have a small patch of sod to meet that um, qualification, but just make your flower beds, make them obviously flower beds, but make them take up a lot of the yard. You know, just putting a fence around a prairie planting and putting in a sign, putting in a bird feeder can make it look much more intentional and that it's cared for. And that can help kind of alleviate some of that tension between a turf grass lawn and, and a wilder yard. There's a group called Wild Ones and they have regional or local chapters and they just had a really great webinar. The recording for this is on their website and it's basically like how to deal with um, you know, when the HOA or your city comes after you because you've, so you've supposedly violated the vegetation ordinance or the weed ordinance. Perfect. Uh, just wanted to point out that uh, a couple of people have shared some resources in the chat um, and just comments to go along with that. Um, but I'll wrap up uh, mm -hmm. questions here and I'll also post all of the resources um, that uh, 
we've spoken about today, which includes the YouTube page where this recording will be shared um, and the resources that Stephanie spoke about in her presentation. And then some contact information if you have any further questions or if you just want to chat about soil health and insects. So I want to thank everyone. Or native for, plants. Yeah. Or native plants, yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, so thank you everyone for participating today. It was great to see so many people and so many people from different parts of the world um, discussing about soil health and how we can um, improve and protect our soils uh, going forward. And thank you, Stephanie, again, for taking the time out of your day and sharing your expertise. Um, I'm gonna echo everyone in the chat right now saying thank you and great presentation. Wonderful. Thanks everyone for joining and for caring about these things and, and for inviting me to speak. <laughs>